Hi, so today we are talking about specialized cell junctions. And this uh, refers to various situations where you have two cells that are side by side such that they are making contact. The, the surface, the outer surface of the two cells is uh, actually touching. And there's some specialized ways in which these adjacent cells can connect um, and interface with one another. Um, there's actually four different types of junctions that we're going to discuss today. Um, they each have their own unique uh, characteristics. They serve different purposes and they're found in different uh, types of tissue. So that's what we're going to discuss today, specialized cell junctions. So as I said, this refers to situations where adjacent cells, side-by-side -side cells, are physically touching each other. In the case of animal cells, that means the cell membrane of cell number one and the cell membrane of cell number two are, are touching. The membranes are, are physically making contact. Of course, if it was a plant cell, it would be cell walls. Um, and so when these cells touch, uh, there are various ways that they can connect and that they can sort of be glued together um, depending on what type of tissue it is and what the purpose is. Um, in animals, uh, this is especially true for epithelial tissue. We're going to primarily be talking about um, uh, cases where epithelial cells uh, are making physical contact with one another, um, at least, well, for two of the four. Uh, specialized cell junctions, we will be specifically referring to uh, epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue generally refers to skin or the linings of body parts, like the inner lining of your small intestine would be epithelial tissue. Um, the lining of your urinary bladder would be another example. Um, and epithelial cells are certainly not the only cells that have these uh, junctions. But, um, but it does seem to be especially true for epithelial cells. Um, so the first type of junction, this would be one that would only be found in animal tissue. Um, it, it's called tight junctions. And you can see in this image, um, actually this, this one image shows three different types of cell junctions. You've got tight junctions here, and then this is one called desmosome, and then gap junction. We'll get to those in a minute. But really specifically right now, I want you to focus your attention right here. And you've got two cells. You've got a cell over here on the left, and then a cell on the right. And we're seeing a nice close-up view of, of where those uh, cell membranes are touching. And in this particular case, you have these special proteins on either cell that are snapping together. I always think of this like the two sides of a Ziploc bag closure um, where, the, where they almost snap together. And it's a really precise sort of watertight seal. And notice there's a seal and then there's a little bit of a gap and then there's another seal and another gap and a seal, so it's kind of a quilted effect. So tight junctions are where membranes of adjacent cells are fused together, like the two sides of a Ziploc bag, by junctional proteins. Th those are the little Ziploc proteins I was speaking of, and that forms a quilted seal. Now if you notice these red arrows, that's supposed to represent some sort of liquid that is trying to seep down in this little crack in between the two cells. But when liquids try to seep in between these two cells, the liquid can get no further than that seal. And even if the first seal fails and a little bit of liquid trickles in between the cells, it's probably not going to get past the second seal. And if it does, it probably won't get past the third seal. And so you've got multiple places where this watertight seal um, is snapped together, holding these two cells together in a watertight or liquid tight way. So the purpose of this is to prevent liquids from leaking in between cells 
And probably the best example that I know of in the human body, uh, I've listed two here, but, but the very best example, at least in my mind, is the urinary bladder. Um, just because you know, think of the, the ick factor, you've got this, this sack in which quantities of urine are stored in your abdomen. And if there's one thing you don't want, is you don't want any urine to leak out of that bladder into your abdomen. You want the urine to stay inside that sack until you're ready to release it from your body. So all of those millions of cells that form the lining of that bladder, every place where one cell comes in contact with another, there better be a, a tight junction. Um, otherwise, some of that urine would be able to seep right in between the two cells and, and leak out of the bladder. And we don't want that. So tight junctions are about preventing liquids from leaking in between adjacent cells. Now, the second type of junction is called a desmosome. And I think what confuses students sometimes on these um, cell junctions is when we talk about desmosomes, we're talking about two cells that are held together very tightly. And so you think, oh, well, that's a tight junction, but it's not. It's not a tight junction because it's not a liquid proof seal. In other words, liquids are allowed to seep in between the two cells where we have a desmosome. So it's not, you wouldn't find desmosomes holding bladder cells together um, because it's not liquid tight. But this is more about holding the two cells together in such a way that they cannot easily shift. If, if you've got tissue that needs to be really tough and strong, like your, your epidermis, your outer skin, or your muscle fibers, the muscle cells that make up a, a muscle, um, those cells need to be held together very tightly. They need to be able to be resistant to physical trauma. Um, they need to be tough. And so desmosomes are uh, situations where we have special proteins and these long skinny keratin protein fibers. This is um, keratin protein, the same kind of protein that's in hair and fingernails. Um, keratin fibers, almost like a thread. Just imagine if you took a needle and thread and you went back and forth and back and forth, sewing the two cells together. That's maybe an oversimplification, but that's pretty much what's going on here. Adjacent cells held tightly together by special membrane proteins. So you see that kind of purplish blue. There's a, a membrane protein. There's another on, on both sides. And then you have these long keratin protein filaments. That's the thread that weaves back and forth between the two cells so that they don't easily shift. They, they're going to stay put and they're going to hold together. Um, this makes tissue mechanically stable. So when, when um, something rubs, I'm trying to get this where you can see it, when something rubs across your skin, you don't want your skin cells just sloughing off very easily. Of course, they do when, the, when, when you have dead skin. It does slough off you know, after a sunburn or something. But every time something makes physical contact with your skin, you don't want your skin to just fall apart. You need it to hold strong and be mechanically stable. But at the same time, you need your skin to be breathable. And so you need to allow substances to be able to seep in between the cells, liquids and various uh, gas molecules um, need to be able to seep in between the cells, but we want those cells to hold together quite tightly. So that's a desmosome. Um, again, the examples of where you would find this in your body would be um, skin cells, especially that outer epidermis that has to be so tough, as well as our muscles, because your muscle cells need to um, stay sort of knitted together to maintain the structure of your muscle. Probably the most interesting kind of connections between adjacent cells are what we call gap junctions. And this is where um, uh, two cells are side by side again. So we're talking about two cells side by side that are touching, but we have um, 
channel proteins that are running across both cell membranes. So it's basically a tunnel that runs from one cell to another. Now, not all animal cells have this, but a really good example uh, of where you do have a lot of this going on is in your cardiac muscle cells, so in your heart. Um, so I'll just go ahead and jump ahead here to the example. In order for your heartbeat to be controlled and, and for your heart muscle cells to coordinate so that you have a nice fluid, um, smooth pumping of the heart, it's necessary for electrical signals to be able to travel very quickly from one heart cell to the next, to the next, to the next. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in order for that to happen, charged particles, ions, need to be able to travel very quickly from cell to cell to cell within your heart. So let's just go through here, uh, kind of summarize what I said. Gap junctions are protein channels. You can see them. They're like channel proteins that, that cross through both cell membranes. Um, they allow, gap junctions allow ions, especially, but also sugars, amino acids, and other things to quickly pass from one cell to the next. Best example of this is cardiac muscle cells where we need for ions um, to be able to very quickly pass from cell to cell um, because you have what's called an action potential, which is like an electrical uh, message or an electrical signal that has to travel very, very quickly through the heart tissue. So I'll explain that just a little bit more here. What you're looking at is a diagram of the electrical activity in your heart. And every time your heart beats, there's a discharge of electrical signal from the upper right-hand corner of your heart, what's called the sinoatrial node. And I'm calling this the upper right-hand corner, uh, even though it looks like it's on the left. But remember, if, if that's my heart and I'm facing you, then, let's see, can you see? My, so this is my right and this is my left. Okay, so this would be the right side of my heart. I hope that makes sense. Um, so on the upper right-hand part of my heart, the sinoatrial node is a little mass of tissue cells that release ions, charged particles, that sets off a chain reaction of electrical activity that must travel very quickly from cell to cell to cell so that the whole top part of my heart which would be my right atrium and my left atrium, I need those to both contract and squeeze blood out at the same time. So both of those chambers have to contract at the same time. And to make that happen, that electrical activity needs to travel very quickly from cell to cell to cell. After the two top chambers of my heart contract, there's another electrical discharge from the center of my heart which is called the atrioventricular node. And it's the same kind of thing. There's a release of ions, um, sodium ions mainly, that start rapidly crossing the plasma membrane. And that sets off a chain reaction where this electrical signal needs to travel from cell to cell to cell. This uh, electrical activity actually travels down the center of the heart and it makes a U-turn down at the bottom so that the bottom part of the heart, which is the, the ventricles, they, they're going to contract simultaneously. The right ventricle and the left ventricle are going to squeeze at the same time and push the blood up and out of the heart into the, to the aorta, um, is where a lot of that blood's being pushed. Um, this is more detail really than you need, but, but the point is for all of this electrical activity to be coordinated and to travel efficiently through the heart tissue, those side-by-side -side, uh, heart muscle cells need to be able to very quickly exchange ions with each other those ions need to be able to pass right across the membrane very rapidly. And that's what gap junctions uh, allow. That's what they're used for. So that brings us to the fourth and final specialized cell junction. Plasmodesmata are almost exactly the same thing as gap junctions. 
except for one important detail. Plasmodesmata only occur in plant cells, plant tissue, whereas gap junctions, remember, were only in animals. So if a gap junction is channel proteins running from one uh, animal cell to another, one heart cell to another, plasmodesmata are simply channels um, running from one plant cell to another. So you're looking at a single plant cell, but right here we see that there's a wall. Um, let's see if I can, Lord help us, let's see if I can draw this. So here would be another plant cell sitting like right here. Okay, so now you've got, um, let me go back to my laser pointer. So now you've got a plant cell here and a plant cell here. They're side by side. And what you're looking at are little holes, basically tunnels, that run from one plant cell to the next. So this is plasma membrane lined channels, tunnels that are lined with plasma membrane that run from one plant cell to the other to allow water and ions and plant hormones and other molecules, RNA, proteins, um, to pass very quickly from one plant cell to the next. So this is uh, going to be something that almost all plant cells have. Anytime you have multiple plant cells and they're physically uh, touching, there's going to be some exchange of, of cytoplasm back and forth between the two plant cells, and that's what plasmodesmata are all about. Um, so uh, very quickly, just to review, we had tight junctions, which are waterproof, liquid-tight connections between cells, like in the urinary bladder, the lining of your bladder. We had desmosomes, which are like where you have thread that's sewn back and forth between the two cells so that they can't shift and they can't pull apart very easily. So like your, your epidermis that has to be tough, that's desmosomes. And then we had gap junctions, which are essentially tunnels or channel proteins that run from one animal cell to the next. And then finally, we have plasmodesmata, which are membrane-lined channels, tunnels, that run from one plant cell to the next. So a uh, pretty quick lesson this time. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Take care, and I'll see you soon.